Hi, welcome to another edition of Antique Radio Archaeology. Today is really going to be a different type of, I won't even call it a restoration. It's going to be a from scratch build on something for an interesting project that I have coming up. And as such, what I'm going to do is I need to put together everything I need for a radio station. Well, the problem is I don't have a transmitter. And that's not unusual. Most antique radio collectors don't collect transmitters. Well, they don't really have access to transmitters. There just aren't a lot of them around. Those that are around are not really usable. You're not allowed to use them uh, because they're going to interfere with uh, neighbors and things like that. They're definitely against the law to fire them up in a lot of cases. Uh, and you also have to have licensing even if you do fire them up. So as such you don't see a lot of the transmitters around and a lot of them were actually destroyed. Um, used for parts and pieces and stuff back in the day. Uh, radio stations, especially during the 20s, the 20s was a very crazy time frame and a lot of these Radio stations had a lot of turnover in equipment as the technology got better and better. Considering that 1921 is really when the radio industry took off, by 1930 it was leaps and bounds ahead of what they had in 1921. Every single year, everything they put together became obsolete. So it's not unusual to have a really fast turnover in equipment. As such, the equipment was varied. Uh, every single radio station seemed to have different types of transmitters and and basically what you had was a bunch of engineers that would get together and they would design and build equipment based on that locality and that radio station. Uh, there were some transmitters that were mass-produced. Uh, DeForest, I think, had one. Um, I, I can't really think of any others offhand, but uh, if you go online and do some research, you'll find that there really isn't a lot of pictures of old transmitters. Uh, they are few and far between, especially during the 1920s. Later on in the 30s, 40s, there, there seems to be a little bit more... Uh, internet traffic on that, but uh, what I need to do is come up with a 1920 style transmitter that I can put together for this mock-up. So I'm going to go ahead and grab some parts and pieces and build a case, build a panel and put it all together and then set up this radio station. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, before we can get started on building a transmitter, what we need to look at is how transmitters looked back in the day. So, what I got here is, uh, this is the station KDKA out of Pittsburgh, and this is a 100 watt transmitter that was built in the 1920s. Now, this transmitter actually uh, was built right before the presidential election, so uh, it's uh, very famous for having uh, transmitted the election results. Now this particular transmitter uses what's called constant current modulation. Now if you look at the schematic what you see is you got a carbon mic going into a mic preamp, the mic preamp sending it over to a modulator tube. The modulator works with the oscillator in conjunction and they're both utilizing that output coil, which gives it the designator constant current modulator. It's also called a Heising modulator, by the way. Uh, but what it's doing is you're combining the audio signal with the RF signal, and you're sending the RF out varying at an audio rate. So these oscillators back then were very very unstable what happens is it does drift a lot so they had a lot of uh, issues but the thing to keep in mind is transmitters draw a lot of current and as such the 
components in it are pretty hefty. Now what they typically use is a copper pipe uh, for the output coil. And uh, you know they had to because everything else in that's pretty robust. The tubes are, are in order to achieve that kind of current draw on those tubes. A lot of times they put the tubes in, uh, in parallel with each other in order to uh, allow more current to pass through the uh, circuits. Now the antenna on this thing was uh, actually kind of interesting. It was six runs, 90 foot long, with 20 foot spreaders. And this thing was 210 feet up in the air. It was between buildings. There was a chimney on one side, a pole on the other. And underneath it was about 110 feet below the antenna was a counterpoise, which is another wire that's run across and that creates kind of an artificial ground. Um, you can look that up online. There's a lot of information on counterpoises, but they're used quite extensively. So this was an interesting setup. Now, the problem that we run into is back in the 20s, um, AT&T owned most of the patents. So in order to operate a transmitter, you had to license with them, and it was a very complex process. Now, Lee DeForest had a commercial transmitter, and that's what this thing is. As you notice, it, it uses a telephone uh, uh, mouthpiece on the transmitter itself. And as you can see in the back, it's pretty robust. Uh, but it was a commercially available transmitter. Now, unfortunately, most transmitters were not commercial. <laughs> they were home built by engineers and they were basically bootleg transmitters. Now what had happened was AT&T found that when they started to sue people, number one they'd have to sue everybody because they went from like 67 transmitters right at the beginning of 1922 to over 400. It was growing fast and most of them were counterfeit transmitters. So, uh, and people wanted transmitters. They wanted these uh, uh, stations to be broadcast, so they were getting ticked off at AT&T for, for filing these lawsuits, basically. So AT&T finally backed off and said, screw it, let them have it. Um, there were limitations, I guess. Uh, there were some agreements made, but basically the licensing stuff went out the window, so most even though technically they were still bootleg transmitters, they remained that way until the FCC really got involved later on in the uh, in the early 30s and started cracking down on everything. Most sites back in the day were initially powered by batteries. Batteries were underneath the uh, desks in a lot of cases. Later on, power supplies were put in place that replaced the batteries. But initially, a lot of batteries were used uh, in order to keep up with it. A lot of lead-acid batteries, because those were rechargeable, but in the more commercial applications, but most amateur transmitters used just regular dry cell batteries, really. So early on, what they would do with a lot of these transmitters, they'd build them open frame. And the reason they did that was, of course, because of the heat involved and accessibility components in the back. It was important to have these open frame transmitters. A lot of them had the coils exposed. It, it, they looked kind of cool, but some of them were actually boxed in pretty nice. So it just depended on who the engineers were and how they wanted to build them. Microphones back then were varied. Pretty much all of them were carbon mics. What they would do a lot of times is they'd take and use large cones in the front of the, the microphone in order to bring in the sound. What was really interesting, if you look, you can also see that they use phonographs. And a lot of these were the old crank style phonographs. And they'd actually put a phonograph horn in front of the microphone to help pull in that sound to the mic. Now carbon mics were pretty inefficient. So a lot of times it took a little bit of uh, sound to get those things to, to work properly. One of the things that was very common trait with a lot of these old transmitters was they used a lot of meters because of the power involved. They needed to keep 
an eye on the amount of current being drawn. Now, they didn't have power meters like they do today. What they had were ammeters, so they used a lot of ammeters and voltmeters and then did the calculations to figure out how many watts they were putting out. That was a common trait. Uh, but then some transmitters didn't have hardly anything. They'd have a couple of dials and mic input and you know on-off switch. That was about it. So they were varied quite a bit depending on the engineers. Almost all the radios had some type of knife switches. They were very capable of handling high current applications so you saw them quite a bit in transmitters uh, whereas you didn't really see those in receivers too often. So some of the things that you might see in a radio station is you would see the transmitters actually in another room and you'd have a desk in the studio area and they would just basically remote the microphones into the transmitter room and, and uh, send things out that way or they were all combined in one room you know where you had the transmitters and the microphones and everything else all in one room now the ideal station if I were to create a radio station there's some things I'd like to see you definitely have to have a transmitter you definitely need to have at least one or two receivers. One thing that's common is telegraph keys. You'll see those along with the sounders. One of the things about radio operators is they had to be proficient in Morse code in order to be licensed to operate a radio. So that was something that was always the case and you saw them a lot on the uh, radio station desks. Now they had to have some way of listening to other stations. They had to have some way of listening to the incoming signal on a wireless telegraph. So you would see a speaker or headphones. Definitely see a carbon mic somewhere. A lot of times they used the old uh, candlestick telephones. By removing the earpiece you basically had a mic and that's what they did. They actually produced them as mics without the uh, earpiece. So that was a common mic that you would see. You'd also see the what they call spring and ring mics, and you would see other variations of microphones as well. You'd always have a phonograph. You'd have some type of battery or power set up, and basically some type of amplifier possibly, and you might see some test equipment laying around. There's just a lot of varied things that you might see at a radio station. So. With all this in mind, I'm going to have, I'm going to put together a transmitter, uh, a couple ammeters, uh, definitely got some dials here, some rheostats, got a knife switch which is very common in transmitters and definitely need the jacks. So that's kind of be, that's what I'd like to do for the layout of my uh, faceplate. So I need to create a box, I need to create a faceplate, and uh, I'm going to have a microphone. This is an actual mic that might have been used at that time. But I'm going to reserve that. I'm actually going to use that, but not... And it is going to be plugged into this transmitter, but I have another mic, a stand mic, that's going to sit on the table. But there's a lot of other props that are going to be included. But right now, let's concentrate on the transmitter. This is going to be the faceplate. What I'm going to use is I have some... I have a Formica, kind of a, a sheet of Formica. This isn't uh, uh, shiny, but it's going to work for the faceplate. Uh, I've got some wood. I need to go ahead and get that prepped so I can start making my box. And here's a couple of receivers that I'm going to be using in the radio station. Uh, so.
to go ahead and attach the Formica to the Masonite board that I've got here. And that's going to be my front panel. And then I can drill into it and do all the other stuff. And I, So I want to basically get this panel done first and then I'm going to go ahead and assemble the box. i got to get that thing stained. And let that sit overnight. Front panel is complete. Ready to go. Got a back panel. I've got the two bottoms, two sides, and I cut some strips that are going to be used to mount the front and the back inside the box when I get it done. Okay, so the whole purpose of that was I wanted to square up this box before I get mess with the front panels because the back isn't as important as the front. So, okay, same crazy routine. I'm going to go ahead and get these things in there. I need to go ahead and get some shellac on this to seal it so that I can lacquer it hopefully tonight or tomorrow. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it today because of the rain. 
but tomorrow's supposed to be worse, so I don't know. I may try to. Alright. Right there. Let that dry and then I can lacquer it. Okay, that's the bottom, so I'm going to let that sit for a little bit, and I'm going to flip it over and do the rest. Okay, so this is the final layout that I came up with, and uh, it's going to coincide with the way a lot of transmitters would have worked. I've got my power inputs here. I'm going to have my three mic jacks slash um, uh, teletype jack. I'm going to have a rheostat here. I've got three tuning capacitors. I've got my uh, switch right here, and I've got a couple of uh, ammeters. So I think this, after going through uh, just basically tons of pictures that I could find of transmitters, this incorporates enough of what most transmitters would have had, and uh, I think this is a pretty good representation of a transmitter right here. So this is what I'm going to go with. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, mark everything off so I can start drilling holes and get all this stuff mounted. So to get the whole pattern on the capacitor, I basically punched a hole where the thing should be and then I just poked holes with a pencil where they need to go. So now I just need to get those end up here. Now what I need to do is go ahead and uh, make the holes the right sizes and then we can clean this up and get it all slapped together. Okay, so cleaned up the holes a little bit. I did countersink these because I had to go with these type of screws because 
of the plates that go underneath it. So let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. Okay, so go ahead and get these in. Have it. One full transmitter. Back 
bolts on. And there you have it. 1920s looking transmitter. So some of the things that uh, I've got going on here with this radio station is you've got the transmitter and it's got microphones coming in. Uh, I've got the main mic here that I would talk on with the push to talk. I also have a small carbon mic sitting in front of a Columbia Graphenola which is obviously a hand crank phonograph which was quite common. And what they do is they talk, and then when they go to play music, they have the mic already set up. Now, if they have other mics, then what they would have going on is uh, you have a selector here. So I could plug in as many mics as I need to and then select between the mics. So if you had live music going, which you could have, you'd obviously have the mics coming in from a different source. Um, so I have a receiver here because obviously there's times that uh, they're going to want to be able to receive information coming across another, from other stations. Uh, there's also all radio operators had to know Morse code. And there's always a Morse code set up somewhere. Here I've got the keyer. The sounder is over here. And it's hooked to a receiver. That's hooked to the transmitter. So there's circuitry that allows them to go ahead and communicate across those uh, formats. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I do have a meter here. Obviously they have meters. Now the batteries for all this stuff will be located underneath the table. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, probably wouldn't use the, the speaker that often, but there are times when they probably want to have it. Uh, so it's just a matter of making sure that they have everything they needed when they needed it. There's not much to it. Uh, of course, as time went on, stations got more complex and things moved around. Now, a lot of times, the, the antenna is obviously going to be suspended outside the radio station, uh, either on the roof of a building or between buildings. They always put the radio stations high up in a, a, a high rise somewhere in, in the bigger cities. Uh, most radio stations were actually located in department stores, believe it or not, uh, because obviously department stores had a vested interest in advertising. So, well that's it. Uh, this has been a fun project and I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing where this goes. Moving forward, I would like to do some things to that transmitter. I would actually like to make it into an actual working transmitter. I will do that sometime in the future. There are some things I'm not real thrilled with about it. I do have some current gauges in it for one. The back panel isn't 
exactly conducive to airflow, so I would have to come up with something to allow for adequate airflow in a working transmitter. So we'll see what happens, but for now it's just a mock-up and it's serving its purpose. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please hit the like button. If you haven't already done so, please hit subscribe. In the meantime, happy restorations, everybody. Hope to see you next video.